You come from above. Like him. He will burn the world to find you. Who? Oh. Greetings, Earthlings. I am Kang. Back in the before times, a main character was shrunk down into another dimension. While there, they discovered an entire world full of other dimensional people. They had a sidekick, and with that sidekick, they conspired to achieve technological marvels. But the sidekick betrayed our main character, taking power in the miniature realm and becoming a genocidal dictator. The portal back to the real world closes, and main character goes into hiding as the traitor consolidates their power, building arsenals and armies in the hopes of one day invading our dimension, which he believes to be flawed and messy and in need of his perfection. Our hero has the MacGuffin that genocidal dictator needs to escape this dimension, and so the hero remains in hiding and in isolation, believing they will never see their family again. Many years later, in the real world, our hero's kid, a renegade tech whiz, comes upon a machine linked to the miniature realm. Genocidal maniac exploits the device in a bid to bring down our hero's friend, but finds that his family suits his purposes just as well. When they try to use the device, they get sucked into the miniature realm. They're captured, but they manage to escape and they find our original hero. Original hero knows the danger they pose because if genocidal maniac finds them, he'll get his hands on the MacGuffin and be able to escape the miniature realm with his armies. Even so, they attempt to plot their escape back to the real world, and to do that, they go to a colorful bar to meet an eccentric agent who they hope will get them out. But this eccentric chap betrays them, and a shootout ensues, and they escape on a magical space yacht. Genocidal Maniac catches up with them and takes one of our new heroes prisoner, believing that this will ensure the others bring the MacGuffin to him. He assembles his armies in anticipation, giving a rousing speech about the campaign to come, pledging to bring perfection to the real world. And his plan almost works. The portal opens, he's so nearly there, but then our heroes fight back. Most of them reach the portal first, but Genocidal Maniac is too close behind, so our main character turns back and sacrifices himself to buy his family time to escape, thereby preventing Genocidal Maniac from using the portal and being transported up to the real world with them, saving everyone or so we think, until a mid credit scene suggests that all might not be well after all. And that's the end of the film. Now, I know what you're asking. Platoon, isn't this meant to be a review of the new Ant-Man film? Why are you describing the plot of Tron Legacy? Well, we're about to find out. It's never an especially good sign when you come into a sequel like Ant-Man and the White Anglo-Saxon Protestant in the Quantum of Solace to find that you have to Google the plot of the previous film. I have, if I do say so myself, a very good memory, which makes me dangerous to drink with, but I don't remember the first film because it's Ant-Man, and Ant-Man is what we might once have called a passenger tier hero. That's not to denigrate him, by the way. The first Ant-Man debuted at the close of Phase 2 and provided some necessary relief as the franchise began to make its move toward a darker and more serious turn, lowering the stakes before the MCU ramped them up again. Believe it or not, there was a time when humor in the MCU could be classed as a relief, and a family-focused, family-friendly, small-time superhero provided a necessary shot of the local and the familiar as the galaxy around it went to war. Even when the second film came out with bigger stakes and a more mind-boggling plot, its placement after the impressive bleakness of Infinity War again made it something of a comedic foil, comparatively happy and light-hearted and once again a friendlier face in a collapsing universe. It's indicative that despite his films providing the time travel or bad writing mechanic that allowed Endgame to function, Ant-Man himself remained largely irrelevant to that story. I don't know anyone who came out of Endgame with Scott Lang at the top of their mind. The quantum realm itself seemed only to exist as the most useful of all contrivances. Ant-Man gets locked there in the post-credits of his second film, re-emerging to move the plot of Endgame forward. And we are coming back to that, believe me. But establishing a mechanic doesn't make the character himself particularly useful. Phases 1-3 to three of the MCU were built, as you might expect, on a three-act structure. The three acts didn't quite correlate with the three phases. Phase 1 charts the rise, Phase 2 begins the second act's fall, but that doesn't culminate until Phase 3's Infinity War. The third act resolution, then, is Endgame's Phase 3 close. The three-act structure has been pretty much the default narrative form roughly since the days of Aristotle and each of phases 1 to 3 and each of the films within phases 1 to 3 tended to use some approximation of it. Introduction, conflict, resolution. Set up, set back, pay off. Three acts within three acts within the three act structure of the overarching Infinity Saga. 
Then, with Phase 4, things went catastrophically wrong for all the reasons documented on this channel and elsewhere. In beginning a new saga, it might conventionally have been thought wise to treat Phase 4 as the first act of that saga, but conventional wisdom has not been the hallmark of the MCU's Disney era, and so Phase 4, which should have strode confidently onto the screen to establish our new set of heroes and the stakes in the next conflict, more closely resembled Stevie Wonder drunkenly stumbling across a minefield of explosive diarrhea. And this, put modestly, poses problems. Evidencing its essential nothingness, Phase 4 was the first MCU phase not to end with or even include some big tie-in event of the Avengers type, which is actually incredibly important. The cynic might see it as an excuse to get all the money bringers on the screen together, but tie-in events in a property like the MCU give the whole thing a narrative cohesion. They show that individual stories are not, in fact, independent of each other. Everything builds towards something, and something is usually building toward something else. When you have such a large and varied cast, bringing them and their stories together to create an overarching plot allows you to clearly establish relationships between characters, between characters in the world, between characters world and plot. The stakes might increase each time, but they become more clearly understood. You couldn't have a plot featuring Thanos finger snapping out half the universe without the tie-in events that show us the tangible consequences of that act. So having botched its introduction, having failed to craft even the semblance of a through line in its plot, having thrown a bunch of new characters on screen with varyingly shite levels of establishment, and having left off with absolutely no connection between any of the preceding, Phase 4 leaves Phase 5 in a position we might call… fucking abysmal. It has all the work to do, and with flagging interest in and tolerance for the franchise as a whole, it also has to contend, for the first time since Phase 1, with an audience that isn't really invested in what passes for its story. Meaning Phase 5 had to get off to an incredible start just to make up for lost time. And instead, it began with Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Now, on to its terribly original plot that has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the Tron Legacy summary at the top. We begin in some dark and eerie corner of definitely not another multiverse with Janet Van Dyne observing some bright star burning through the sky, then getting attacked by some eldritch creatures and discovering a wounded and confused Kang the Conqueror, reminding us all of the gaping chasm where his character should have been throughout Phase 4. I speak as one of the vast majority of people who didn't think it worth bothering with Loki, and I vaguely recall being promised that people wouldn't have to subscribe to Disney Plus in order to understand the mainline films. Quite obviously a lie at the time, but one I mean nonetheless to hold them to. This is, for all intents and purposes, our first introduction to the villain who is supposed to anchor the entire franchise a la Thanos. And so, the guy who has been conspicuous by his absence thus far. Ask a normie who Kang is, and they likely couldn't even tell you the franchise he's a part of. We're then back in what is supposed to be present-day San Francisco, but which quite clearly is not, because there are no homeless people defecating in shot. Scott Lang delivers a bit of cheerful exposition of the type we'd have never needed if the character had been, I dunno, Tony Stark. My life doesn't make sense. I am a divorced ex-con who is a time-traveling Avenger, etc. Because the film recognizes that there is a good chance that much of the audience, like me, has a hazy at best memory of this recently promoted character. To its credit, the film makes a joke of this. Scott is recognized, but not everyone actually knows who he is, for example. One shop owner refuses to take his money because he's a hero, but bids him farewell with Goodbye Spider-Man, a joke that lands far better than Doctor Strange's bug-themed superheroes comment in Multiplex of Ninjas because it actually acknowledges Scott Lang's often irrelevance next to the more recognizable heroes, rather than serving as some smug, cynical meta comment excusing the plot's failure to explain the absence of other heroes who would have been immensely useful to it. The overall tone of the introduction mitigates what might otherwise have been some fairly affronting exposition. This is more of my backstory. This is Hope, whom I was very lucky to meet, etc. Because it does manage to blend in some of Scott's quirky, small-time origin story. An honorary award from the manager of the ice cream store he got sacked from in the first film, for example. This is the film at its strongest, and Ant-Man as a character at his strongest, with the same local appeal as Spider-Man, not a universe-saving, hyper-powered superhero, but an ordinary guy with a familiar backstory and entirely recognizable roots. Of course, the film won't stick with this, because the MCU is crossing into every imaginable universe and dimension in the vain hopes it will find a story somewhere, so we learn that Hope now owns her dad's old company and is using the Pym particles to achieve global change, much like the Wakandans didn't with their vibranium. 
She's saving the world in all the ways Hollywood people like talking about and achieving on the screen but never in reality. Affordable housing, reforestation, etc. All fashionable, all tedious. Scott's on a book tour, telling kids to make mistakes and take chances because there's always room to grow. Which could serve as a meta defense for Phase 4's faux experimental nonsense, but that, if I were to break the habit of a lifetime and stop being a cynical ass, is a nice enough message, I suppose. God, that's really fucking unnatural coming out of my mouth. My tongue feels weird. He's called away because his daughter, a now grown up Cassie, has got herself arrested. Cassie is now a bratty teenager, which means she will probably be the moral center of the universe going forward. Her introduction sees her sardonically berate an arresting officer for firing tear gas at peaceful protesters in a park. The early signs are that Cassie Lang will be given a marginally more fulsome introduction to the MCU than any of its recent female heroes. Hugo Chavez and Riri Williams had no introduction at all besides being on screen as props, so any introduction counts as a better introduction than theirs. But the early signs also indicate that she's going to be an insufferably smug know-it-all with a power and knowledge set beyond what's justified by her experience, which might leave us wishing she too was a mere prop and not a sincere attempt at character writing by people who think that college girls are the unimpeachable epitome of wit and brilliance. Things don't get very much better where she's concerned. She justifies her apparent attack on the police by saying that they were clearing out a homeless camp, not something the San Francisco police is known for. And it's not their fault they're homeless, they lost their homes in the blip. Nobody can afford rent unless they're some trust fund asshole, and so on and so on. Reality intrudes to remind us that it's probably the affordable homes policy Hope's been pushing for that's played a big part in making rent unaffordable, but our in-universe observation must be, wait, what, we're doing the blip again? That's, that's funny because we've been told quite recently that the MCU has moved on from the blip. That was the defense of it for She-Hulk's failure to account for it. But She-Hulk was not the only Phase 4 entry guilty of that failure. Almost every Phase 4 entry failed, even though the original line deployed was that Phase 4 was all about accounting for the consequences of Endgame. Gee, it's almost like they had no plan. We're to take it from Ant-Man and the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant in the Quantum of Solace that Sam Wilson telling a senator to do better did not, in fact, solve the problem. Well, color me whatever the opposite of shocked is. At this point, the biggest superhero in the MCU will be the guy who manages to get San Francisco to let more houses be built. Cassie's tone and general demeanor and unjustified skills and unjustified knowledge set is a problem with this film specifically. She has her own suit now, by the way, and we know she's hyper-talented because she tells us she is, and everyone accepts it as a given. By contrast, that the film's attempts to invoke past events prove jarring is not a problem specific to this film. That's a problem with the MCU as a whole. World building doesn't work if you only do it when it's convenient and otherwise forget all about it. You cannot move on from the blip and then invoke the consequences of the blip to explain the present state of affairs. You leave the audience wondering just what about the past they're expected to remember or pay attention to, and asking just what the hell is the point of that investment if the past is only relevant for about five minutes and then forgotten all about and contradicted again. By the way, I said recently over on the Desolate Soul Studios podcast, I'll link in the description, that the blip should have been the ideal excuse to localize the narrative again, to kickstart the next saga with small-scale stories that allow us to familiarize ourselves with our new set of heroes, the new problems they face, the new relationships that are forming. From whence we could have built, as phases 2 and 3 did, into a bigger galaxy-spanning adventure. And this kind of small-scale localized building is what characters like Spider-Man and Ant-Man in particular would have been well suited to. But instead, well, instead we're gonna get all of this. Ugh. Back home from prison, all the family's having pizza, and we learn that Janet hasn't told anyone anything at all about the 30 years she spent in the quantum realm. Nothing at all, as in absolutely nothing. Remember Kang? Oh, we are coming to that, believe me. For now though, no, she's told nobody anything because because she doesn't want to. That's the reason. She wants to live in the now. That the now includes a family that wants to know what she did during her 30 years in the quantum realm is neither here nor there. She's decided that living racked with guilt and full of secrets and earning the animosity of her loved ones by telling them nothing despite them occasionally asking her is what constitutes living a normal life. Rightio then. I'm sure this won't become relevant again in a couple of hours. Hank lets slip that Cassie has been arrested before. An argument ensues. Scott is apparently the only person who cares that Cassie gets herself arrested. 
She, you see, is absolutely in the right when she says, At least I'm still trying to do something with my life. Everyone just quietly accepts it when she belittles Scott's role in saving the universe from Thanos. At least we're still trying to do something that matters, she says, and everybody accepts that this is right because, it transpires, most of the Ant fam is involved in whatever that something might be. This film is ostensibly set around the time of Wakanda Forever. That means that Scott's been back from the quantum realm for quite some time, comfortably more than a year in fact, and his mum's been back even longer. The problem is, the film struggles to convey this, finding it much easier to act as if next to no time has elapsed. Scott has no knowledge of Cassie's arrest record, nobody's made any serious attempt to discuss the past with Janet beyond the occasional vague half assed question, and Scott's been kept entirely out of the loop during the creation of quite a big and complex and presumably time-consuming experiment set up by half his damn family in his damn house, meaning we've got three separate instances of shoddy characterization. Scott's unfamiliarity with the present, a marked lack of curiosity about Janet's past, and Cassie's seemingly unearned ego. The first and third should be fairly easy to fix, and it'll be interesting to see if the film tries to fix them, which is to say, it'll be interesting to note how the film avoids trying to fix them. Of the first, Scott needs another, more present reason for an entirely different kind of absence, something that's distracted him from becoming reacquainted with his family in the more than a year he's had to do that. That, alas, is going to be hard to achieve, given the thrust of the preceding argument is that he does nothing with his time anymore save Hawk books and his own professed sole interest in family life, which we heard about in the opening narration. Cassie, on the other hand, will need a chance to show what skills she's learned, but also, and crucially, those skills will have to be shown to be unformed and frequently insufficient, providing a check on her pretty insufferable ego and allowing Scott a chance to teach her things. There is frankly no way to fix the Janet issue at this point, and the film is shortly to go on to break it even further so we can look forward to that. Things don't improve when we learn what the experiment in the basement is. Cassie explains that during Scott's five-year absence, she started reading Hank's journals and so became, obviously, a complete genius where the quantum realm is concerned. Hank encouraged her in this endeavor, though he takes care to say that she did all the work herself. Janet, though, was kept in the dark. Comfortably more than a year has elapsed since Endgame, and I must remind you because the film pretends that that is not so. More than a year during which an entire lab was constructed and an experiment conducted in the family home under the nose of two members of that family, which, to say the least, strains credulity. Janet asks why nobody ever consulted her about the experiment. Hope says that she tried, but that Janet never wanted to talk about it. Nobody apparently thought to show Janet the experiment in a bid to spur her interest and make her open up, even though all the fam is apparently very keen to do both of those things. Cassie and Hank, but really just Cassie because this is the modern MCU and because Hank tells us as much, built, to use Hank's phraseology, a subatomic Hubble telescope in the basement, a device that lets them map the entire quantum realm without ever needing to go there, because we don't have enough inexplicable girl bosses in the MCU already. Now, a defender of girl bosses might counter, but Tony Stark did all sorts of crazy shit. He solved time travel in about five minutes. And suddenly on the latter point, I would partially agree. As is almost always the case with time travel, Endgame magicked it into being as a lazy contrivance, and it's one of those things you sort of have to forgive and forget to avoid collapsing the plot of that film. The difference, though, is that Stark had a fully fleshed out character, an established genius shown at several intervals, but one which dovetailed with profound character flaws. He was the acknowledged tech wizard billionaire playboy genius, of course, but he was also a selfish asshole who had an awful lot to learn, both about the technology he was working with, but especially about being a decent human being. This creates a rounded character, skills and deep, deep flaws. And the skills could never fully compensate for his flaws as a human being. He had to go on an arc. The modern tendency, though, is to have schoolgirls with no character history be able to mimic his technical skills exactly while demonstrating not only none of his personal faults, but no character flaws at all. As has been said many times, it is this, and not some mythical sexist bogeyman, that's led to the poor reception of the MCU's latter-day female entrance. Nothing has been done to justify their talents, and the absence of meaningful flaws precludes the possibility of character arcs. The MCU has entirely forgotten that flaws are what make characters interesting, not perfection. Empathy and sympathy is what drives the audience to invest in them, not applause and acclamation. Yet we've been told explicitly 
to cite just one example that plots must be bent out of shape to exclude male heroes in order that female heroes are the sole recipient of that applause and that acclamation. Black Widow was especially guilty of this. She couldn't be allowed to seem reliant on male heroes. Left unsaid is that male heroes are always reliant on each other, and indeed the entire universe relied on Black Widow's sacrifice in Endgame. And this mutual reliance, the complementarity of character and skill sets, is what basic things like relationships are built off of. We learn about and invest in characters through the interplay of their flaws and their accomplishments, clashes of personality that lead to defeats, the overcoming of that strife leading then to the ultimate victory through sacrifice. Hence everybody loving Natasha Romanov and even Wanda before she went evil and the MCU demanded that we applaud her for that as well. Hence too the reason nobody gives a damn about America Chavez or Riri Williams or Jennifer Walters or now Cassie Lang. Scott, of course, gives Cassie the due applause and acclamation, but Janet is alarmed to hear that the device Cassie's built works by sending a signal down to the quantum realm. She freaks out and unplugs it. She says, there's something I should have told you, but before she can finish, the device turns itself back on and it starts sucking things, ants, and eventually all of the fam down into the quantum realm. Remember the ants, by the way, you see them for perhaps one and a half seconds. They will become very, very relevant at the end of the film, but they will not be mentioned until that point. This is the MCU. So, of course, a long and mind-bending CGI sequence follows. And it's amongst long, mind-bending CGI sequences that we're going to spend pretty much all the rest of the film. Well, everything we've seen so far looks amazing. You know, so much of this film is all about the quantum realm. We've seen like a little bit. What can you tell us about shooting there? I mean, the scenery, they did a lot of practical effects and world building. We had dirt, like actual dirt at our feet um, that we're walking around in. And uh, then you have a blue screen around you, too. So I'm actually going to see a lot of stuff for the first time. And I'm really excited about that as well. But even though the film is doing Tron Legacy, as you should by now have gathered with its setup, and even though it had a bigger budget and undoubtedly a bigger and more advanced VFX department than that film had, its various CG horoscopes don't display an ounce of the innovation or the unmistakable style displayed by the thing that it's stealing so much of its plot from already and will continue stealing from in future. Scott and Cassie are in one place. Hope, Hank, and Janet are in another. We learn that the quantum realm has changed a lot since the last time anyone was here. For one thing, there's a quantum spaceship scanning for them from which they have to hide. Scott gets attacked by a giant fiery jellyfish of some sort. Cassie attempts to act. It doesn't go well. They then get pursued by a goop monster and then saved by a motley collection of quantum people with a robot that shoots lasers from its face. Three months. It's been three months, I think, since I last reviewed an MCU product. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really good to be back. Janet apologizes for not telling Hank and Hope about all of this in the year plus she's had in which to do that. But notably, her apology does not contain any new information as yet. Her, sorry I didn't tell you, is markedly less useful than her saying, right, sorry I didn't tell you this place was different but here are all the really important ways it's different that you really need to know if we're going to survive all of this. She has no apparent incentive not to tell them more immediately, given their stated objectives are finding Scott and Cassie and escaping alive. But I guess we've got two hours left to fill, so... So nah, we have to keep the mystery, even though the character involved in it has every incentive to demystify it for us, because if she were to do that now, we couldn't justify the runtime. She does inform Hank, that the reason he never discovered any of this when he was down here is that he couldn't look deep enough. She explains that there are worlds within worlds within worlds in the quantum realm, outside of time and space, confirming that, yes, we do indeed have a second multiverse on our hands. Or perhaps it's, it's the same multiverse? Uh, that, by the way, is a distinction without a difference. Your ability to comprehend and understand the stakes in one multiverse is infinitely impossible. So who cares if they've doubled infinity? This, as I said near the top, is exactly the opposite of what characters like Ant-Man are ideally used for. We've got Doctor Strange in his multiverse of badness, we've got the Guardians hopping all over the galaxy, likewise Thor, and with nothing as yet to tie them together. The MCU already has too much of this kind of thing. Like Spider-Man, Ant-Man is a character pretty well suited to the task of pulling us back to something local and comprehensible. At the very least, Doing so is what makes him and his role in the MCU distinct from anybody else's. Even if you disagree with me on the merits of localizing narratives, 
and if you did, you would be wrong, I think you'd have to agree that there are uncounted numbers of problems with having all of your characters off in spaces too vast to be realizable. Amongst those problems, what's the fucking difference between them? Where's the goddamn contrast? Why should we fucking care? The quantum people take Scott and Cassie back to what appears to be the hall of melted sex toys. Cassie tells Scott that he has to drink some ooze from one of the sex toys. Meanwhile, the rest of the fam, who we left as they were walking through the quantum jungle, have seemingly teleported into the middle of a quantum desert, where they too are accosted by some quantum people in a caravan of quantum balloons. Yes, and Janet says she'll handle this, whatever this is. The head of this tribe of quantum people would appear to be some sort of, um, thing, and Janet cuts its arm off and stabs it, so then they hug because they know each other and are friends. They get some new outfits and a ride on a generic CGI monster. Something to note at this stage, you might recall, Janet's recently told us that the quantum realm, this realm within a realm within a realm, is outside of time and space, yet this film is going to proceed as though time in this dimension of the quantum realm has proceeded in exactly the same way, along exactly the same lines, as time in the real world. She knows these people, she met them in the past, that's how they know each other. So, the quantum realm is not outside of time and space. The quantum realm has our time and space, for narrative purposes. It's one of those concepts that writers really should just avoid, unless they're prepared to actually explore the consequences. Speaking of inconsequential, Hope has thus far been a complete passenger in this script. She's present, but she's not at all involved. This half of the story belongs entirely to Janet. Hope just stands around gormlessly, throwing in the odd line like, After you but being otherwise denuded of all agency. Now, it's never especially easy to balance a story with five protagonists. Ordinarily, splitting them up, which allows you to split the narrative and so the focus, helps in this endeavor. Someone who might fade into the background in a group of five will, should, be more present in a group of three. Thus far, though, the script has deployed that function but without reaping any of the rewards. The Janet Hank Hope arc is just the Janet arc, with Hank serving as the expository foil and Hope standing around with her Vulcan haircut and emotional range, which absent characterization might have been forgivable had her replacement, Janet, not been another shallow girl boss type throughout this opening act. She's essentially a much older version of Cassie, hyper competent, hyper knowledgeable, a strong and talented fighter. The second of these is of course explicable. The film is rightly taking this opportunity to flesh out a character who's only really been a MacGuffin in previous installments, but who has unique knowledge of this realm born of her long experience. But as is always the case with the modern MCU, it's refused to share out its skills. There's no complementarity between its characters in evidence thus far. This is basic Dungeons and Dragons stuff. Your party each has a specialism. The best party has the best range of skills between them. Individually, they might be doomed, but together, they function as a unit. Adopting that approach in this film would see Janet specialize in knowledge, Hank in tech and application, and Hope in physical fighting ability. They all rely on each other to escape. But that's not what's happening. So far, we've had Janet with knowledge, Janet with strength, Janet with innovation, Janet with fighting ability. Hank serving as excuse for her to exposit her knowledge, and Hope just kind of watching as Janet deploys her only useful skill set in this scenario being a competent fighter. It's the Rey Skywalker conundrum again. If your hero is perfect at everything, what even is the point of the sidekicks? Meanwhile, the ooze is ceremonially brought to Hank and he is forced to drink it, after which he's suddenly able to understand the assorted creature features. It's Babel ooze, I guess. That's a reference. We know this because a strange creature tells him that's what's happened, before proceeding to ask if he wants more ooze in his holes and asking him how many holes he has and apologizing if that's a personal question, which I did almost smirk at. Except that this style of humor really isn't that different from, I don't know, every other MCU film at this point. Again, proving that one of its defining flaws at present is that it's all just indistinct. You can't have a comic relief character if every character does comic relief. The leader of this tribe is inevitably another badass girl boss who pushes the plot along by saying that Scott and Cassie come from above like him, and he will build the world to find you. He is the conqueror, you see. The rest of the fam flies on a manta ray to the highly mechanized quantum people base of some sort, I don't know. One of the creatures looks like broccoli. We know this because Hank tells us, Holy that guy looks like broccoli. Janet takes them to definitely not the Star Wars cantina, 
and also definitely not the Tron Cantina, where they do drink some goo. They drink it as shots, though. One kind of wonders why translation goo is served in bars here, but let, let's not, because there's a long way left to go. Broccoli flirts with Hope, which at least affords Hope the chance to speak in this film for a change. She says, Oh God. And um, that that's it. That's, that's her line. Janet comes back and tells Broccoli Boy to fuck off. Janet explains that she was a freedom fighter while she was here. They've come to meet a contact of hers. Even though they've only just got here and she only just asked to see the contact about 10 seconds ago, a quantum spaceship arrives and off steps Bill Murray. Which is a real shame because I've got a near 100% record of liking every film Bill Murray is in, and so far I really don't like this one. By the way, the editing here is really quite peculiar. You'll notice, if you actually go and see the film, and I wouldn't blame you for not, that Bill Murray never actually shares a shot with anyone he's talking to save for Janet, which looks incredibly suspicious because the dialogue is quippy and fast-paced, meaning the camera snaps back and forth and back and forth and back and forth incredibly quickly. Hank says a single word, the camera is on him and him alone. Bill Murray says a sentence, the camera is on him and him alone. Hope says something, it's on her. Bill Murray responds, it's on him. It's janky and disjointed, and it feels distinctly plastered on, as though all of this was added much, much later in production, pieced together from existing shots. It's not how the rest of the film is shot either, meaning it's distinctly possible the cameo was finalized and added very late on, the actors involved just never really standing in the same room together. Back with Scott, we learn that his group of quantum people has been nearly destroyed by the Conqueror several times. They are rebels. Chief Girlboss explains all of this and Cassie offers to help them fight, for reasons, but Scott refuses. Meaning, of course, that Cassie gets to bad-temperedly put him down for being self-absorbed and careless and lazy and too cowardly to help. And you just know, you just know, that the person who'll eventually learn the lesson that corrects their attitude will be... Scott. And, and not Cassie, because Cassie is right and Scott just doesn't realize it yet. Bill Murray seems quite salty that Janet left everyone down here to suffer under him. Him, meaning Kang, and teases her about not having told her family about any of this. Yeah, we, we are still going to get to that, just, just bear with. Bill Murray, though, Bill Murray now works for him. He's a traitor, don't you see? Because he's basically Zeus from the bar in Tron Legacy, and he informs the Ant Fam that all the Ant Fam will be taken to him, including Scott and Cassie, who he heard about because uh, that's that's what the script demands happened, even though there's been absolutely no indication that that's even possible. And he, the Conqueror, has sent the Hunter to go pick Scott and Cassie up. So, you know, they might just be dead, even though we know they're not. Bill Murray says everything could have been avoided had Janet just given him what he wants. And he explains his betrayal of whatever cause they used to fight for by explaining that he, the Conqueror, can be very persuasive. And I have a crushing feeling that's all we're going to get and yet yeah, indeed it is, because the Ant Fam escapes. There's a shootout, Hank enlarges some kind of jellyfish thing, it, it glomps Bill Murray to death, and he's still not shared a shot with any of his fellow actors. I mean, how do you waste Bill Murray? The Ant Fam steal his luxury yacht ship thing, which device? Quirky, charismatic actor often featuring in Wes Anderson films appearing to play himself only to get bested and see our heroes escape in his luxury yacht seems suspiciously like Thor Ragnarok to me, and yeah, also Tron Legacy. Have I, have I mentioned this? The basic plot structure is basically, you know, Tron Legacy, uh, and they're now doing the Solar Sailor sequence. Back with Scott, Chief Girlboss tells one of her generic CGI friends to take he and Cassie as far away as possible, because if they're looking for Janet, then he, the Conqueror, is looking for them. Uh, I'm still not sure how that works, by the way. If he could track their descent from our world, why is it taking him so long to pick them up? If he couldn't track their descent from our world, how did he know where Scott and Cassie were? given they've never encountered anyone liable to dob them in. Maybe he doesn't know where they are. He already knows where they are. No sooner has Chief Girlboss said, he's looking for you, than some quantum spaceships appear in the sky and start gunning everybody down, massacring the quantum people tribe. Everybody panics. There's action. There's lasers. Chief Girlboss beats the shit out of the assailants but gets captured only for Girlboss in training Cassie to finally remember she's wearing an Ant-Man suit and so she miniaturizes and goes to rescue her. Happily, genuinely because it goes some way toward achieving one of the conditions i set out near the top scott does step in to save her at one point and he does teach her some of his moves after she cocks up the timing that is the good 
The bad is that the sequence is really just an excuse for bog standard Marvel quipping, meaning we now have to keep an eye on whether the film revisits it with a more earnest lesson later on, or whether the unfunny skit was the object and the lesson merely incidental. Humor or character development? Hmm. Well, this is the MCU, so the answer will be humor 9 times out of 10, but you know, there's still a chance this film will be the one. An inexplicable lull in the fighting and by lull I mean everything just kind of stops and the evil robot attackers just disappear for a bit, presages the arrival of a big bad quantum ship thing that destroys damn near everything, including the flying dildos the quantum people tribe were using as escape shuttles. The evil ship lands, and it turns into… this. This is, this is what we get. This weird monstrosity is Darren Cross from the first film, apparently, though now he's called mechanized organism designed only for killing, or MODOG, according to the film. Though I think I'm gonna call him catastrophically rendered antagonist person, so crap. Remember Phase 4? Remember how the CGI in that often looked like absolutely abysmal? And Astrid's projection in Thor Love and Thunder was so badly done, you had to hope it was deliberate because the alternative is that whoever designed it was worked so hard that he had a stroke while at his computer. Well, this this might actually be worse than that, and I think we're beyond the point now where it's bad deliberately is like a legitimate excuse. It's tonally jarring as well. We've just seen innocent cutesy little aliens getting mercilessly slaughtered, and now in the next scene we get this. It's like going from a scene in Platoon, and then cutting away to a shot of Ronald McDonald on the gunship grinning maniacally as he slaughters villagers. Crap serves Kang. Know what the film could have done though? It, it could have just not done this. There was no need for it besides some masochistic need to flood the internet with memes. You could have cut crap out of this film entirely and had Kang make his entrance here, slaughtering all the quantum people and showing himself to be a bad motherfucker. That would have been efficient. It would have shown Kang to be a ruthless evil bastard to be feared and loathed in equal measure. But no, nah. Instead, we got crap. Over with the rest of the Ant Fam, Hope tries to get Janet to go rescue Scott and Cassie, but she says, nah. Hope accuses her of hiding something from them, which she is, because she still hasn't told them anything about what's actually going on down here. There had better be a damn good reason for this film, a really, really good reason. And then, finally, Janet decides to tell Hank and Hope about Kang. Here's how it goes. She explains, and we see in the flashbacks, that she found him in the quantum realm while she was trapped there. He said he was a scientist and an explorer, he had a magic spaceship capable of traveling the multiverse. They worked together to fix it because it was broken. She says Kang felt so lost and they couldn't find a way to recharge the ship, so they stayed down there together and became friends. In a flashback, she tells Kang that she thought she'd have more time with her daughter, so Kang offers to give her time, telling her that time is not what you think it is. He describes time as a cage, but says that you can free yourself from it. He promises they'll get out of the quantum realm together, and eventually they do manage to recharge the ship, via means the film doesn't even attempt to explain. What it does kind of explain, because it's essential to move things along as quickly as possible, is that the ship is neurokinetic and connected to Kang's thoughts, so when Janet touches it, she sees his mind. She sees all the many worlds and peoples and even entire timelines that Kang has wiped out for… reasons at this point, and he hadn't crashed in the quantum realm he had been exiled there by someone. Janet explains that they sabotaged his ship and trapped him here. But now, she's accidentally set him free. He offers to help her escape anyway because she saved his life, and she says, nah. She asks him what he'd do once he'd taken her home, and he says, win. And he morphs into Armor Kang, I, I guess. Having got his armor back, he now has many of his powers back as well. He offers to bend time to make it so she never even left hope to begin with, and promises that, whatever he does next, he won't blow up her earth. But she says, nah again. She won't let him leave, and she goes all anti and steals the ship core. Then she blows up the ship core with her PIM device whatevers and traps them both in the quantum realm. But because he's Armor Kang now, he's hugely powerful, and he built an empire in the quantum realm. She ran and hid, then Hank and Hope eventually saved her, but she didn't deserve it because of the monster she unleashed. And then, here's the clincher. That question we've been asking from the top, why hasn't she mentioned anything about any of this to anyone before, despite it being the most important information she possesses? Well, her excuse is, I'm sorry I never told you. I just wanted to forget. I just wanted to be your mum again. 
That's a direct quote. And everyone just accepts that. Hope says, I'm sorry you had to go through all that alone, but you're not alone now. I mean, what in the righteous name of holy fuck is that film? Well, God, where do you even begin? In the first place, why couldn't they find a way to recharge the ship until the plot decided they could recharge the ship? They don't try anything new on it. The whole charging process is just Janet holding some sparkly sticks around. It doesn't work, and then it does work, because reasons. Why did the film steal Age of Ultron's villainy reveal by having her touch the ship and see his plans? I mean, couldn't they come up with anything new? Why does having your mind linked to a ship mean that anyone who touches that ship can read your fucking thoughts? Why did it show these thoughts in particular? Is it that he thinks about nothing besides plot-relevant information, or was it pot luck that she didn't touch it while he was thinking about what he'd have for breakfast? Could he read her thoughts when she touched the ship? Well, apparently not, because if he had, he'd have killed her pretty much instantly. Why, given he must surely have known what would happen, did he let her touch the ship to begin with? Was there no way he could have prevented her from doing that? Some lie he could have told? Or even just, you know, standing in the way? Why, like a fucking lemon, did he hang around and try to convince her to go with him after he'd got his powers and his magic ship back? Even assuming his ship, that can travel through multiverses, couldn't travel through the quantum realm on its own and needed something that she had in her possession to escape. That's an excuse I've just made up in a bit to explain his actions, by the way. It's not actually in the film. Well, even then... Why did this all-powerful asshole not immediately knock her out and take whatever he needed? Why did whoever exile him, exile him with his fucking ship? Why didn't they kill him to begin with? Plenty of people have been in and out of the realm without a ship anyway. Wasn't leaving him alive and exiling him with a broken ship just asking for trouble? What was to stop him finding a way to fix it himself? If his powers are tied to it, sending him down there with his ship in any state is exactly the thing you wouldn't want to happen. Why does Armor Kang have powers normal Kang doesn't, and why is his armor tied to his ship? Isn't that like a needlessly vulnerable mechanic for anyone to invent? Like saying you could have the powers of Superman unless your Alpha Romeo broke down? And why? The Shuddering Fuck, knowing all of this, having explained all of this, understanding the multiverse ending threat that she's unleashed, didn't Janet tell anyone about it? I I'm sorry, but... I just wanted to forget it is not an adequate explanation, darling. That's like inventing interdimensional mecha Hitler and just not telling anyone about it because you can't be bothered. I'm sorry, darling. I'm sorry I didn't tell you I just created interdimensional mecha Hitler and gave him control over time itself so he can go on a multiversal holocaust. I just wanted to live a normal life as your mum. You didn't really need to know anyway. It's not like, you know, you and my son and my husband are scientists who like fucking about with the quantum realm as a weekend hobby. I never thought it'd come up. Honest. Oh, you could put infinite monkeys in a room with infinite time and they would never come up with this shit because they take too much pride in their work. Jesus Christ film. And of course, it goes further, by the way, because we will learn at the end of the film that Kang was exiled by the Council of Kangs. And the Council of Kangs is shown to be hyper-precious about their status as rulers of the interdimensional multiverse. By hyper-precious about it, I mean that this film, or, you know, its mid credit scene, which is the only thing you actually need to see to understand what happens next, is going to go on to establish that the Council of Kangs is prepared to go to war with the multiverse to maintain their control of the multiverse. Yet I can't help but remember, in Multiverse of Madness, the Illuminati killed a variant of Doctor Strange because even though he'd saved them from Thanos, he'd done it by pissing about with the multiverse. Meaning that the Illuminati handed out a far harsher punishment than a council of genocidal supervillains whose sole motive is maintaining their multiversal dominion. They just exiled the biggest known threat to their entire existence while the Illuminati killed Doctor Strange for keeping them in existence. Do you ever get the sense that these films don't really connect because nobody involved in making them actually thinks through what they're doing? Anyway, Kang introduces himself to Scott and Cassie. We learn he's killed all the Avengers at various points in various timelines and he's bored by it. He's so bored by it, he doesn't even remember which Avenger is which. Which is a far bigger headfuck than the film has time to explore. If he's been locked down here for 30 years with Janet, then he was locked down here before the Avengers formed except that there probably is a timeline in which he was never locked down here, or a timeline in which they were formed far earlier, and given there are infinite timelines, the answer has to be both. In which case, there are infinite Kangs out there wiping out the multiverse. Yeah or no? Is he the only one in all the cosmos who's doing that? Is this the only timeline in which a Kang took issue with other Kangs and got himself exiled? 
But if he's wiped out the Avengers in several timelines, to the point of being bored by it, why is he even doing it? What's his motive anymore? If there are infinite Kangs in infinite timelines, then he's irrelevant. If there's one Kang but infinite timelines, then he'll never destroy them all, so why should anybody care? It's like they've taken all the bollocks from a time travel device and multiplied it by all the bollocks of a multiverse device and not even bothered looking at the answer before they put it on the screen for us. Kang tells Cassie he doesn't experience time in a straight line, and when you don't experience time in a straight line, it's hard not to skip to the end. So if they want to stop what's coming, they have to do what he tells them. Even though that doesn't work because he can just wipe out the timeline in which they stop what's happening, while in any number of infinite alternate timelines it never happens and oh my fucking god I don't care. I don't know why I'm thinking about this, the film didn't. Credit where it's due, Jonathan Majors, the actor, is putting in a reasonable performance. He has presence, he conveys menace. He doesn't have to do much, but then, giving what's necessary is much more important than giving everything. He has the menace to pull off a very good villain. But the MCU needs to establish mechanics for this villain if his villainy is to really mean anything to the audience. I get the sense what they're really doing is just a rehash of Thanos, except instead of half the universe, it is timelines being expunged taking an already unfathomable premise and making it utterly incomprehensible. The advantage the writers of phases 1-3 to three had is that you didn't need to comprehend the loss of half the universe, you only needed to see the local results, the loss of half of our heroes, half the population of our planet. With timelines, that's very difficult to replicate, because humans don't really conceptualize timelines to begin with, and the premise of the multiverse is that there are potentially infinite variations of any heroes we are seemingly going to lose who could just pop back into existence at any given moment. TLDR, I mean, what the hell are the stakes now? Cassie asks him what's coming, and Kang says, me, a lot of me. But he also offers to get them home if Scott steals something for him. And it's not really clear what he expects them to take from all his information. This is pretty meaningless to them. It's the informational equivalent of cock teasing. Scott says no, so Kang threatens to kill Cassie and make Scott watch it again and again in time, endlessly. Though, and it could be that I've just lost my mind at this point, but I do seem to recall his issue being trapped down here is that he is out of time and so cannot control time because the quantum realm doesn't exist within time. But never mind, I guess. He tortures Cassie a bit, not that you could tell from her acting. So Scott says, okay, I'll do it. So he has to go to the center of the exploded ship core, some sort of multiversal spaceship core, I don't know, to retrieve whatever the fuck. Well, conveniently, Janet and co arrive in their quantum yacht at pretty much the same time. Scott has to go into it to find it and resize it, and Crap explains that the longer he's in there, the more his mind will come undone, much like mine watching this film. Scott says goodbye to Cassie and dives on in. We get another long, generic CGI sequence that's entirely lost its effect because we've seen it several dozen times already. He reaches the bottom, and then he does indeed start to go a little bit mad, so there's two Scots now. Crap explains that he's in a probability storm, and he keeps splitting into multiple versions of himself. The ostensible mechanic is that every choice he could make exists here all at once, so all of his many versions start arguing with each other. I mean, it's, it's creative-ish, on the highest level, of course, it's impossible to actually depict this on the screen. You can only do your best. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy does improbability infinitely better than this, but that's a radio show. It's also clever and actually funny, which this isn't. But again, you can only do what you can in this medium. Unfortunately, though, even that half-hearted defense of this scene is, well, undermined. Because this, too, has been done before. What we see in this sequence is essentially the architect's room from the Matrix combined with World's End from Pirates of the Caribbean, all the many Jack Sparrows in David Jones's locker being faintly comical with each other, but without any of the charm. To complicate matters further, the yacht arrives. Apparently, neither Kang nor anyone in his empire of highly advanced quantum Japs spotted it, despite it being on the other side of the thing they're all staring at. And an hour and ten minutes into the film, Hope finally gets a chance to do something, jumping into the core after Scott, who she heard over the radio, conveniently. There's not a huge amount of point describing the nonsense that follows with all the Scots and temporarily all the hopes. It's not supposed to make sense, after all. At one point, Scott gets trapped under his infinite selves, only for Cassie to radio and tell him to come back, which makes all of his possible selves act like ants in unison in concert to help him up. Because what the film is trying to convey is that Cassie is his top priority in all possible lives and all possible iterations of lives. 
even though that technically breaks what passes for this mechanic because there's always the possibility that he or any one of his infinite selves either didn't think this or thought it but imagined a different way to achieve it or wasn't listening or was panicking too much to pay attention you know there's all of these possibilities that was the mechanic right every possible action existing in the same time and space so no i mean i like what it's trying to do but it doesn't just doesn't work the only result from this has to be chaos you would never get all of your possible selves acting in concert like this anyway admitting that that is just what happens scott climbs to the top of his mountain of selves but when he tries to shrink the core it doesn't work and so he starts to fall but then in a moment we might as well just call meta hope arrives and she lifts him up and for no good reason all his possible selves immediately just disappear and they fly up together and shrink the core after all. I mean, is it even worth evaluating the choices here? Janet, Hope, and Hank know, and Scott knows some of, the likely consequences of what they've just done. The choice they're actually presented with, which the film doesn't seem to have quite understood, is do we, the Ant Fam, get out, potentially at the cost of Kang destroying whole timelines? Or do we stay and sacrifice ourselves here, but save the multiverse? They've chosen themselves, which is odd, not least because Janet refused to even mention Kang to anyone because of how dangerous he is and because she wanted to live a normal life. You could forgive one character for getting this or being so strongly motivated to return to their family in our world that they are willing to take the risk irrationally. But the film's ensured that no such motivation can exist because all the Ant Fam are down here together. And because all the Ant Fam are down here, we're meant to believe that not one of the five of them thought, no, nah, you know what? we are not worth more than the entirety of the existence of the multiverse this risk is too great to take and then on top of all of that not one of an infinite number of possible hopes and scots thought that in the earlier scene which would have ruined the entire operation my god i fucking hate multiverses it does finally re-enter janet's mind she pops up and when scott tells her that kang has cassie so he has to help kang janet says she promises they'll save Cassie, but he cannot under any circumstances give Kang the core. Which, yes, is probably the correct answer. Finally. Even if it should have precluded her even arriving here to say it. Keep in mind, she has known all of this since the beginning of the film. The subtext of this exchange is that she is prepared to sacrifice anything, including her own granddaughter, to prevent Kang getting the means to escape. Recall, then, that they are only down here because she didn't warn her family about all of this to begin with because she didn't want to. I don't know that there's in any way of reconciling this incredibly stark contradiction. She is prepared to sacrifice her family to stop Kang, but she wasn't prepared to sacrifice her own relationship with her family by telling them about Kang, thereby ensuring that they would never accidentally encounter him. Uh, this, this, um, it doesn't really make sense. Kang pops into the scene at this point and tells Scott that Janet can't be trusted because she sometimes changes her mind. Real persuasive argument there, my dude. Of course, what the film is trying to do is make us realize, and to make Scott realize, that Janet's promise about saving Cassie is just a ruse, which we already knew. The narrative use for this reveal is that it should shatter Scott and Janet's relationship and trust in each other, because Scott now knows that Janet is prepared to sacrifice his daughter for her cause. Potentially massive stuff, that'd be a shame if the film went on to do absolutely nothing with it. Meanwhile, Crap flies up and confronts Hank in the space yacht, which of course makes it impossible to take any of this seriously. I mean, talk about a balked tone. We're jumping between the potential death of all existence in all timelines, the potential death of daughter, the potential sacrifice of daughter by grandmother, and fucking crap in a space battle with Hank. Crap causes the yacht to crash, but Kang kidnaps Janet before she can go and help Hank, and they warp back into the evil quantum city. Though the film kind of forgets this is what it's done because while they walk into the portal together, in the next moment, in the next scene, despite no time having been implied to have passed, she is brought to the throne room to meet Kang, who is lounging on his fancy chair like he's been there for hours. He asks her what she saw when she touched his mind. This is his chance to explain his motive, which is that only he can see that time is broken. He explains that he broke it, all his many versions throughout the multiverse, playing with time like children. He says he saw their ends, their chaos spreading across realities, universes colliding, endless incursions. He saw the multiverse and it looked tiny, all because of his alternate self's miscontrol. And so he took control. Janet implausibly reasons from this that his motive is therefore to start a war to wipe out any universe that's a threat to him, which is not 
really what I would have thought you would take away from the preceding argument, but okay. She tells him that's what monsters do. He says it's what conquerors do. End the broken worlds and create new ones. He says she has no idea what he's lost and promises to, and I quote, burn them out of time. His alternate selves, that is, by wiping out the entire timelines in which they can be found, thereby murdering trillions. This can only be described as pure, unadulterated shite. Versions of himself are going around fucking up timelines, and he doesn't like that he's doing that, so he's going to go and kill himself in his alternate selves, not by tracking them down and wiping them out, but by expunging the timelines they're in for the crime of making those timelines a bit messy. I mean, there are literally infinite problems with this premise, but I think most of them can be neatly summarized with the question, why? Why is he the only one of him that doesn't like himself messing with time? Why is wiping out timelines preferable to pissing about with them? Why is he the only one who can see them all? Why is wiping out timelines better than just wiping out the versions of himself? How many timelines and versions are there? What's to stop other Kangs wiping out the timeline he's in? If there are infinite timelines and infinite hymns, what's the point anyway? If the people who exiled him are him, why would they have exiled him with the ship they must have known would give him all of his powers? Why did they exile him and not wipe out the timeline he was in, thus having done with it? And so on, and so on, and so on. Why, 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 and why again? I also can't help but note the similarities between his motive reveal and Wanda's motive reveal. Both characters essentially excuse their meddling in the multiverse because of the injustices they've suffered. Kang's, you've no idea what I've lost, could well have been cut and pasted from Wanda's excuse making in Multiverse of Madness. I don't hear anybody trying to pretend that he's justified in his actions, nobody saying, they've no idea what you've sacrificed for them, or agreeing with him when he bleats about the unfairness of being cast as a villain. We are all quite sure, and we are all supposed to be left in no doubt, that he is a dick, even if this particular dick might eventually be dwarfed by a bigger, harder dick. But I'm genuinely not sure that's the point in the film's favor. I never thought I'd find myself praising Multiverse of Madness, but by comparison with Kang, Wanda actually has a strong and intelligible motive, madness driven by the desperate loss of her children. That's not to skirt around the essential nonsense of that plotline, Wanda's nonsensical villainy, Strange's bizarre decisions, the non-involvement of any living Avenger who might have been able to talk her down, the entirely unnecessary fixation on finding two versions of her children among an infinite number of universes with infinite numbers of those same children, etc, etc. But it is to point out that I'm evil because I want kids is orders of magnitude better as a premise than I'm evil because. The essential similarities in the premise also harks back to the profound missed opportunities in Multiverse of Madness. As I said after my Thor Love and Thunder review, a natural and potentially captivating course for the Multiverse saga could have done something new for the MCU as well, taken a hero in Wanda and shown her slow descent into madness, her gradual absorption into and then by the Scarlet Witch, her emergence as the principal antagonist of an entire phase of films, if not for the saga as a whole. Through her experimentations with the multiverse, we could have been exposed to it gradually and always anchored in the clear and present stakes of known character and tragic motive. You could have played it in any number of ways. Wanda presenting as increasingly sad and desperate but still on the side of the Avengers initially, albeit with some unseen foe, causing ever more chaos and destruction, incursions from other universes, resulting from her secret manipulation of it with the Darkhold. The ultimate reveal then being that it was her all along as the Scarlet Witch. If she's a saga-long villain, the reveal at the close of Phase 4 could have been our first glimpse of her villainy form. The legacy cast who no one loved her best like Hawkeye and Vision could have tried to bring her back from the brink, fighting to save her from herself. She could have teetered on the edge, then been forced to kill one or both of them, providing a tragic end for those characters and the tragic birth of the Scarlet Witch Ascendant, who then escapes into the multiverse to mastermind events through Phase 5. Or she can be defeated in this form at the close of Phase 4, but her meddling with the multiverse is what alerts and alarms the Council of Kangs who emerge for Phases 5 and 6. As at the end of the Thor video, I'm literally just taking a premise and running with it here, I've not planned this out. It actually doesn't take much effort to imagine any number of full saga plans that actually builds on established characters and relationships, rather than throwing them around randomly, killing time until Kevin Feige flips a coin and decides that now is the time for Kang. But in the event, that's what we got. Meanwhile, Cassie is being marched from nondescript place to nondescript place because the film couldn't think of another setup for her impending escape. 
Nobody thought to steal her gadgets from her, so she escapes. Then, and just just go with me on this one, we learn that Hank got rescued from his crashed ship by some ants that fortuitously fell into the quantum verse with them. Remember? Remember how we saw that for about two seconds at the beginning of the film? He's been picking up their signals throughout the film, it turns out. But this is not just Ants Ex Machina. No, it has to get more bullshit and convoluted than that. They fell through some time warp bullshit that let them live thousands of years in a day, building a whole advanced scientific civilization in the quantum realm. No, I'm not making this up. And, and I'm still not making this up, they are socialists. They are socialist ants. Hank tells us this. He says we could learn a lot from the socialist ants. A rigidly stratified society with a queen at the top, useless and sick ants killed and disposed of, and used to build walls around nests, everyone blindingly following the chemical skid marks of other ants. Yeah, yeah, we've got a lot to learn from these socialist ants. Absolutely, film. I mean, ants are a monarchy, which would be the obvious joke to make because they have a damn queen, except that monarchy is unfashionable and socialism is hyper-fashionable. So screw the internal logic of the joke. The A in AOC is ants now. Mind you, you could tweak it slightly and refer to this system as anti-socialism, which would make it much more palatable. Should we leave it there? Nah. Nah, I don't think so. Because Hank explains that the ants have created a Type 2 civilization in the quantum realm. According to the old Kardashev scale, the human race isn't even a Type 1 civilization. A Type 1 civilization is capable of harnessing all the energy on its own planet. A Type 2 civilization is able to harness the energy of an entire star through the building of Dyson rings and Dyson spheres and such. That's an unfathomable level of technological advancement compared to our present state of being. Now, you might be wondering, why is all this science nerd stuff relevant? Well, because it means that Hank Pym is able to cross in and out of the quantum realm. He is able to commune with, even control, ants, ants who have achieved a Type 2 civilization. This gives Hank Pym the theoretical ability to bring a Type 2 civilization and all of its science and technology out of the quantum realm and into our own meaning essentially that Hank Pym could in one moment advance the human race, using the old Kardashev scale, by something like 3,200 years in a day. You think Tony Stark's arc reactor was impressive? Well, that's like Paleolithic tools next to the science Hank Pym and his ants now have at their disposal. It's hard even to begin to conceptualize the profound, universe-altering consequences of this single line of dialogue. Happily though, it's the MCU, so... We probably won't have to. I'm sure we'll never hear about it again. The ants and the ant fam hatch a plan to save Cassie. Cassie herself is busy rescuing Chief Girlboss from prison, though why she's still alive is a total mystery. As are many of her fellow tribes people come to that, even though Kang was explicitly billed as a genocidal maniac. I guess he just kind of forgot about that because if he killed everyone, like we've been frequently told he would and does, how could we then have an uprising scene later in the film? Honestly, it's quite something to have minimal plot and minimal characterization and still manage to set them at war against each other. The plot, meanwhile, is doing Tron Legacy again. Kang shows Janet the huge army he's been building and that he plans to take with him through the dimensions and into the human world to invade. He even gives a holographic speech to his minions, a la the catastrophically generated image of Jeff Bridges. Cassie interrupts the transmission though and sends a message to the brave rebels instead and incites an uprising. Kang orders Crap to go kill Cassie but she breaks the inexplicably unmurdered prisoners out of jail and there's a fight slash chase scene instead. Kang finally decides he's been pissing about and wasting time and inserts the core into his evil doom ship, which he could and should have done ages ago and only didn't because the script needed him not to do that yet. Giant Ant-Man then just marches in from the middle of the huge city. No idea how he got there and how nobody noticed him, but whatever. We're now into what I hope is the film's final battle, which is just standard MCU fare flying around, spaceships, lasers, shooting, the natives in their dildo ships and flying fish monsters turn up just like the rise of Skywalker because that's where the bar is set now, and we settle down for the obligatory bangs and whistles and flashy lights and explosions. The stupid monster thing from earlier revives the whole's joke, and by revives I mean it, it buggers the corpse of it. I have holes. I have holes! <laughs> Kang goes to launch the ship because he still hasn't done that yet, and Ant-Man struggles to get through the ship's energy shield. 
As is obligatory in these films, the triumphant beginning hits its setback period where everything seems doomed, but then the heroes triumph staringly. In this case, augured by Cassie growing big and twatting crap in the head. Which occasions this now famous line. I don't know what to be. Tell me what to be. I don't know, just don't be a dick. Say, remember how the entire multiverse is at stake and the evil genocidal time traveling asshole in his doom ship is taking off right over there? and the stakes have literally never been higher. Yeah, but we're gonna take a break from that in order to pretend that we are conveying a moral message while what we're in fact doing is rubber banding the film's emotional range. We've got a teeny, tiny little bit of slack that allows us to faintly register severity here, sadness there, tension over there, but the rubber bands very swiftly snap us back into the weightless, soulless center of the production. A joke disguised as the shallowest and most unimaginative and cognitively untaxing moral lesson you could possibly have included. Don't be a dick. It's never too late to not be a dick. Jesus. Yeah, I think we'll come back to that in a moment. The Doom Ship's bridge, meanwhile, got a little bit exploded, but Kang and Janet are still alive, and Janet is still a prisoner. He magnetos his way down and starts murdering natives with those powers that would have been very handy if he'd used them a bit earlier, but then the Ant Fam turn up to confront him. And he does another, none of this is new to me spiel, which is appropriate given we've already had this speech. And indeed, we've already had this entire sequence time and time again across the MCU. But then, the socialist ants turn up and invade. Like the Soviets pouring into Nazi Germany and raping all of the German civilians and then their descendants telling us decades later that it was them who won the war guys, not the Americans. The socialist ants have a giant mecha ant. Again, not sure how nobody in the city saw these guys coming and tried to stop them or even alerted Kang about it or anything, but never mind. The ants struggle to get through Kang's energy shield as well, but then crap turns up, having been profoundly moved, ostensibly by Cassie's not quite moral message, but much more likely from the concussion. He sacrifices himself to destroy the shield, and the ants seemingly kill Kang. Well, this Kang anyway. There are other Kangs, even though, you know, this is the only one. Oh, you actually. Fuck it, never mind. We already know the film isn't bothered about ensuring its mechanics are consistent. Kang will return, probably much sooner than you think, given there's still a chunk of this film left to go. Crap dies, and once again, the film cannot decide what tone it wants to strike here, because though it seems to want us to be sad about it, what with his noble sacrifice and all, it also plays his death for laughs, repeatedly. Him asking if he's, you know, saved everyone, and, and Ant-Man awkwardly looking away, him saying, well, at least he got to die an Avenger, and Ant-Man awkwardly looking away, and on it goes. Despite the ship's core being broken in the earlier explosion, the plot decides it can still work just one more time, so Janet plugs it in and opens a portal back to the basement lab. The Ant fam go back through the portal, but Kang returns just in time to stop Scott. Kang tries to jump through the portal himself, so then we get the obligatory fist fight and another bit of Tron Legacy setup. Kang doesn't have much trouble overpowering Scott but seems to keep forgetting that his ultimate goal is getting through the portal, so he doesn't take any of the dozen or so breaks in the fight to, you know, actually go through the portal. Instead, he monologues and beats the shit out of Scott for a bit. Which, of course, gives Scott enough time to fuck up the portal core generator thing. It doesn't die immediately, though. Oh no, it stays open for a little bit. Kang finally runs for the portal, but Hope emerges and shoots him. She and Scott knock him back into the collapsing core, which still doesn't explode but rather traps him for a few seconds. Rather than them running for the portal themselves, Hope and Scott just kind of stand there for a bit and watch until it does indeed go bang, leaving them, seemingly and unnecessarily, stranded in the quantum realm. By the way, Tron Legacy, which is a very flawed film, nonetheless does this much better. In that film, it's OG Flynn, his son Sam, and this Ghost in the Shell extra who are trying to get to the portal. Clue, the program Flynn created in a bid to bring perfection to his system, is the one trying to stop them. The basic events are the same between the two films. The fam reaches the portal, Clue arrives in time to yank Flynn away, Clue goes for the portal, Flynn distracts him, they have a fight, Clue seemingly wins, but Flynn sacrifices himself to stop Clue and let the fam escape. But Tron Legacy actually bakes in a reason for Clue to be distracted from his goal by Flynn. He actually has two motives, complete his programming and invade our world, get back at Flynn for his perceived betrayal. The whole thing's a play on the parable of the prodigal son. Sam is the prodigal son, returning to his father from far away. 
Clue is the older brother, the one who did everything his father asked of him, yet finds himself, in his mind at least, overlooked and cast down by the younger son's return. On the bridge in Tron, Clue hesitates and delays because he has two conflicting motives, get Flynn's disc to gain access to the portal for his armies and take personal revenge against Flynn for what he perceives as a betrayal. Clue did everything Flynn asked of him, created the perfect system, and Flynn still turned against him. So Clue goes for Sam, the prodigal son, in a fit of rage, and he has to be reminded by Flynn of the real reason he's here, get the disc, which he thinks that Flynn has. He has a reason for delaying what would otherwise have been his certain triumph. He's vengeful and he feels abandoned more than he feels like a conqueror. Kang, by contrast, has no motive to stay. He is a fanatical genocider. He's already told us that he's killed the Avenger so many times he doesn't even know which is which. And yet, when given these opportunities to go for the portal, he doesn't take them. Instead, he stays behind and even goes out of his way to rail on Scott and shout at him a bit, paying off a motive that simply isn't there. Scott should be nothing to him. He's said as much in the film already. And yet, Kang acts in this moment like Scott is everything to him. Hope and Scott have a lovey-dovey moment in which neither of them seems especially fussed that they're trapped here as far as they know for eternity and their daughter is unreachable to them. It is, again, a strangely shot moment. It's celebratory in tone, even though there's a huge, big qualifier that they might never see their daughter again you know, even though they could have if they'd just run back through the portal rather than standing around like gormless idiots for about 30 seconds. And the scene goes on and it goes on and they don't acknowledge their situation once. Because, it turns out, though they couldn't really have known this, it certainly wasn't a safe assumption, Cassie, it turns out, can just open the portal again from the other side in a matter of seconds. So they get to go home after all. Incredibly lucky that the device didn't break or malfunction when it was hacked from the quantum realm at the beginning of the film, basically destroying the lab by sucking everything into itself in a mini implosion. We wrap up then with a very similar sequence to the one with which we began, Scott wandering around narrating. But then he remembers that Kang said something bad was coming if he didn't get out, and he has a brief but abortive existential crisis before he snaps out of it with the injunction, stop overthinking it. Might as well be addressing me personally there, Scott, but with this film, thinking about it at all probably does constitute overthinking it. The plot doesn't actually hold up to scrutiny. Shocking suggestion I know of a Marvel film. And that's the end. Except, of course, for the post-credits Kang Council scene with Pharaoh Kang et al. Yes, the film really is doing We Was Kangs. They feel very threatened that exiled Kang was killed by humans with knowledge of the multiverse, meaning the Council has summoned the rest of the Kangs to, I guess, go wipe out the humans and anyone who threatens their multiversal dominion. I hate to delay the end of this video still further, but how? How do they know this? Were they monitoring the Quantum Realm? If they were monitoring the Quantum Realm, and they've been monitoring it since Exile Kang wound up there 30 or so years ago, wouldn't they have already spotted that humans have been popping in and out for a while now? Wouldn't they have spotted that Exile Kang had his ship back and that he'd built an empire and an army in a bid to start a multiversal war in the near future, whatever the near future means in a franchise which has decided it can't really be bothered with time anymore. And just to add one final quandary, what the hell was the point? The stakes, nominally, were that Kang couldn't be allowed to escape because he'd go about destroying infinite timelines. He didn't get out, which means infinite timelines are still at risk because Kang because his alternate selves pose an existential threat to infinite timelines. Meaning this film has essentially sterilized itself, it's neutered itself, it's denuded of itself of all meaningful consequence. What a spectacular waste of time. There is, by the way, a second post credit scene where old-timey Kang appears in an old-timey auditorium before a crowd including old-timey Loki and old-timey Owen Wilson. But life is too short to watch Loki, and once again we were told that you wouldn't have to subscribe to Disney Plus to make sense of the MCU, so I neither understand nor care about this scene. Summing up then, since we have finally reached the end of the film, Cis Hetman and the Bee in the Multiverse of Quantum was certainly one of the films in the MCU. It was a film that was produced and was made and then released and that appeared on our screens in the month of February in the year 2023. Trying to say very much more about it than that is tricky because it feels like everything worth saying has been said now for every MCU entry since at least January of 2021. Those hoping for a marked upturn in form from the apparent nadir of Phase 4 
will probably be disappointed. Ant-Man 3 was like an anodyne version of the last three films, a milquetoast variant of Love and Thunder's humor, a desaturated version of Multiverse of Sadness's world-bending histrionics, a pared-back iteration of Wakanda Forever's alleged character and family-driven plotline. Solely by virtue of its mind-numbing midness, Ant-Man 3 probably avoided the most egregious flaws of those three films. Its humor I don't think was quite so obviously forced as Love and Thunder, its world-bending wasn't quite so baffling as Multiverse, its message wasn't quite so insufferable as Wakanda, but I'm not sure this can be called an improvement. I felt a great many negative emotions after watching Thor 4, Multiverse and Wakanda, but at least I felt something about them. Yet here I am now, approaching the end of this script, really struggling to give anything that even vaguely resembles a shit about it. Part of this is undoubtedly a meta issue. The MCU overall has been spiraling into a convoluted irrelevance for some time, so its newest entries have ceased being disappointing and taken on the tedium of expectation. On the level of plot, nothing is really being tried that hasn't been tried already and done better, both within this franchise and elsewhere, and we're so very used to it getting worse that there's no longer any shock value to the disappointment. Working very hard, this film's defenders could say that it's a charming story about families coming together, overcoming distances and past struggles, learning and growing and saving the world together. But that describes a trope, not specific characterization. It's a premise the film had to, but didn't, make distinct. That premise and trope was also present in Wakanda Forever, which was a terrible film, but still managed to make its deployment of that trope at least partially notable. It allied it with an attempt at grief and the overcoming of loss, which really presented as parodies of emotion, but at least strove to achieve something emotional. Shuri had to overcome the death of her brother and her mother to discover the fortitude required to take up the mantle of the Black Panther. Ant-Man 3, by contrast, gave us… well, what? The pretense at family strife? Built on strategic amnesia. The film pretending that the Ant fam hadn't had time to solve issues and relationship problems that could have been repaired in a week, never mind the year plus they actually had in which to do it. It gave us aspiring girl boss daughter who had precisely half a lesson to learn from Scott Lang, otherwise chastised for the distance and ignorance and listlessness that the film's introduction actively worked to show us didn't exist in his character. It gave us full-fledged girl boss mother, Janet, possessor of all the knowledge and all the skills required to make use of it. The film attempted to tell us that her flaw was that she wanted so much to be a normal mother that she'd hidden information from her family in a bid to move on which is an asinine read of the real flaw, that she didn't tell anybody about the impending multiversal genocide she's unwittingly cooked up because she didn't want to. Hank Pym is reduced to an expository foil and then a mere vehicle for Ant's ex machina, and sometime propagandist for fully automated insectoid communism. Scott's loving family man drive and persona somehow resulted in him knowing nothing at all about his family, while Hope simply isn't a character. Cassie and Crap's exchange immediately preceding his sacrifice, was laughably trite, but it did actually serve as the film's core moral message, which is a depressing realization, nothing deeper or more meaningful than don't be a dick. There's really not much more to the film than that. Its characters contradict each other and themselves without actually striving for anything we haven't seen a dozen times before in the MCU. It's all much of a sameness. The MCU's answer to that sameness, most particularly in multi-pack of blandness, and now in Ant-Man 3 is entirely superficial. It rests in its new visuals, not in its characters or its story. But the thing about superficiality is that it's, well, superficial. We can be kind and we can say that the visual effects in multiverse were innovative, but once we've had superficial innovation of that kind, wacky distortions and weird colorscapes and peculiar goo monsters, it becomes hard to praise it again. After multiverse, what is there really to praise about Ant-Man's kaleidoscopic backdrops? We've seen it all before. We saw it just a few months ago. In two or three films, it's reinvented the sameness that it was supposed to be trying to break from. We need something more than that. Differentness and weirdness cannot carry an aesthetic alone. It's worth a final Tron Legacy comparison because that's an example of visual design allied to a purpose. Tron Legacy has a consistent internal design and a consistent aesthetic approach. It's a pretty unremarkable story, but that was elevated to a degree by its setting in a fully realized and unarguably distinctive world, where Ant-Man 3 is borrowed from multiverses, it's surreal so it's good approach to design. Tron Legacy accomplishes visual storytelling, Ant-Man 3, like everything else in the MCU these days, doesn't have a story to tell, with its visuals or in any other medium. 
Given Ant-Man attempted finally to introduce the saga's overarching villain, you might counter that the more came from Kang. His backstory, the discovery of his plan, the revelations about the Kang Council and their coming multiversal war. And you might have a point, but it would still be an incredibly limited one. Yes, we do at last have some vague sense of where the overall story might be going. That, in theory, gives us a sense of direction. On paper, it establishes stakes. But how much of this actually exists, and how much of it is new? The big bad who threatens existence certainly exists now, but that can hardly be called new or original. The nominal difference is that the threat posed is to the multiverse and to timelines this time, and to whatever else, rather than to half the population of the universe. But this seems like a distinction without very much difference. It doesn't actually mean anything. It's not comprehensible. It doesn't present meaningful stakes because it contains its own impossibility. If there are infinite timelines, and infinite variations of that villain, and all of our many heroes, you can't recreate the Thanos effect by distilling his plan into personal consequences. You can't disappear half of an infinite cast of heroes. Coupled with Phase 4's inability to give us characters to care about, or stories to invest in in the first place, what really are we supposed to care about with any of this? The attempted originality is ostensibly based in its world building. We have a multiverse now. We have a quantum realm. The story might be fundamentally the same, but it's happening somewhere else. And that gives it new consequences and connotations. Nah, no it doesn't. That's, that's just a facade. This isn't world building. This is a bid to make world building redundant. The multiverse is a non-thing. The multi-qualifier references an infinity and so is, practically speaking, meaningless. A kind of not here via negativa approach that only really serves to tell you where the story isn't. It's a boundless concept, unconstrained by rules like linearity and structure, character limits, physics, even time itself. The quantum realm, again ostensibly original, is really just a partial reskin of that multiverse. It still means nothing. It's still ungraspable. Everything about it can change at the whim of whoever writes the next film that's set there. If its depiction in Ant-Man 3 seems to make a little bit more sense than the multiverse in Multiverse of Madness, it's only because the film chose to stick, and only for the most part, to one of the Quantum Realm's layers. And even then, it made it so expansive and indefinite that you could never really place yourself or identify with any given locale or set of peoples. Whereas Phases 1-3 to built off localism and tied character stakes to familiar and universal drives fears and aspirations. From phase 4 onward, the obsession has been with maximalism. How can we make everything as big as we possibly can? The Infinity Saga showed that it was possible to blow up the stakes while keeping them grounded and realizable. But it did this by recognizing the importance of individual characters, stories, and places. If Ant-Man 3 was ever going to succeed as a major entry into phase 5, never mind as the debut film kicking off phase 5, it would have been because it had exploited its smallness to use the obvious pun. Like Spider-Man, Ant-Man is a character ideally suited to localizing stakes and condensing stories into a solid, relatable, and tangible domain. Post-Infinity Saga, that's what the MCU should have done. Begin again, build from the ground up, build our familiarity with a new cast, give them stories we invest in. Then you increase the threat gradually, expand the universe into a multiverse if you have to, but you do it piecemeal glimpsing it from the bottom up, not the top down, always relating it to the places and peoples that we know and love, and only after you've done all of that do you part the curtains and show the whole. But instead, Ant-Man 3 took one of the characters best suited to its first act and just blew everything up. Again, no characters, no real plot, incomprehensible stakes, and yeah, we've seen it all before.